welcome everyone. I am Dr. Sheila Segerson, a veterinary behaviorist and director of outreach and research at Maddie's Fund. Mm -hmm. This is the first of our Maddie's Insight webcasts. I'm really excited about this series. These are monthly webcasts on the first Thursday of the month where we hear from experts, experts in the fields of animals and animal welfare. And each session is going to contain highlights of research results, as well as actionable recommendations based on those results. So we can translate that research into real life advice. I'd like to start by introducing our speakers. Dr. Michael Hennessy is a professor of psychology at Wright State University. He is a behavioral neuroscientist with interests in both basic laboratory research on stress and how this research can be applied to reduce the impact of stress on dog dogs in animal shelters. Uh, personally, um, I don't think he knows this, but you are one of my heroes, Dr. Hennessy, and that uh, when I first got into this field, the work that you had done um, really inspired me and the work that I, that I have done. So I'm so excited to have you here. And uh, your PhD is in experimental psychology at Northern Illinois University. And then you did postdoc training and served as a research associate in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. And subsequently holding the position of research psychologist at SRI International. And since joining Wright State has had stints as a vid visiting scholar at both the California National Primate Research, Ce Research Center at UC Davis, where I went to, and the Department of Behavioral Biology at the University of Munster in Munster, Germany. So welcome, Dr. Hennessy, and Regina Willen will also be speaking. Regina is the founder and executive director at Halo Canine Behavior. She's also a neuroscience and physiology scientist. Um, I've spent some time talking with Regina over the past year and um, just an amazing human being, and I've learned a lot from her. She is a board certified associate certified applied animal behaviorist with the Animal Behavior Society and is an animal behavior consultant with the IAABC. She has extensively studied the behavior of shelter dogs in and out of the shelter and specializes in creating behavior programs that are practical for shelter staff volunteers, and busy families. So I am going to turn it over to you, Dr. Hennessy. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sheila. That's a very flattering introduction, and I'm glad you talked to me into giving a, <laughs> a, a webcast. All right, so yeah, I, I, I do have a, I have been studying basic research and, and, and stress for uh, a long time. And, and at some point, uh, it was uh, made clear to me that um, the, the work that uh, we do might have some application in, in dog shelters. And so what I want to really talk about today is, is that interplay. So how uh, what we and others have done in the lab um, uh, translates into um, information that we can learn in the shelter and studies we can do in the shelter. And then once we got in the shelter, how we, we had some surprises and how that informed our later work in the shelter. Uh, and, and the reason we can kind of uh, go between the laboratory work, which is with you know, mostly laboratory rodents and with dogs is because the, the stress response system in mammals is pretty much the same across species. And, and that includes our own species. So I'd like to start with our own species. So if I asked a hundred people what they find stressful, I, I, you know, we'd just get a whole bunch of answers, no question about it. We get some like this: a car accident, uh, you know, an injury, uh, a painful disease. You know, these are the sorts of things that that cause physical harm, and so are usually referred to as physical stressors. But if if we had those hundred answers, I'm sure we'd have many, many more that would have no physical harm. Things that might be serious, like diagnosis with a disease or or death in a family, um, uh, and then some things that might not be so serious but would still certainly be stressful. You know, a job interview traffic right and and so these don't involve the the the, the physical uh, harm and so they're referred to as psychological stressors or psychogenic stressors and and there's just you know any number of those but by and large we can boil those stressors down into a much smaller number of, of basic elements that makes them stressful and these include things like uncertainty 
So when a, an event is uncertain or unpredictable, novelty, when we're in a completely novel new situation, um, feelings of loss of control over what we're doing or, or, or over our life. Um, for social species like us, social separation from important partners is a, is a stressor. And then if a, a certain symbol indicates that something bad is going to happen, that symbol of threat certainly is going to be stressful as well. And we know that these things can be stressful for laboratory animals because they are particularly uh, effective in activating the body's primary stress responsive system. And, and this is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So just briefly, the, um, the stimuli activate the, 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 the stress that these uh, uh, generate are perceived by the brain. And that results in the brain, the hypothalamus of the brain, releasing a hormone, CRH, which goes to the pituitary, which releases a hormone, ACTH, which then goes to the adrenal cortex above the kidney, and that releases the glucocorticoid hormones. And of these, cortisol is, is the main one for, for us and, and for dogs, and that's the one that I'm going to focus on today. And so, you know, during times of stress, the release of cortisol can be very helpful. It can, it can give us energy to, to deal with whatever needs to be done. It can sharpen our cognition and it can increase our memory for that event. So we're unlikely to get into, less likely to get into that uh, uh, situation again. But cortisol effects are adaptive when they're brief. If, if the stress goes on for a long time, the longer it goes on, the, the more likely it's going to be detrimental rather than helpful. And with chronic stress, uh, with continually high levels of cortisol, you can have all sorts of effects on the body. Uh, virtually every cell in the body has a, a receptors for cortisol. And this is a simplistic slide, but you can see that, for instance, weakened immune system, altered brain structure and function, uh, increasing anxiety and depression, which are all relevant for the kinds of things we're talking about today. So, you know, I, I think by now you probably have connected the dots here that entry into a shelter uh, contains virtually all these elements. Um, but then the question is, does, does entry into a shelter really increase uh, pituitary adrenal activity and cortisol levels? And the answer is absolutely. So this is from a study a long time ago. And what it shows is that dogs who are in the shelter for the first day have much higher levels of circulating glucocorticoids, cortisol, in the bloodstream than do dogs who are pet dogs who are sampled at home. And, and I'm gonna be showing several slides like this. So if you're not familiar with them, in these slides, the height of the bar indicates the average of all the dogs in this group. And then if you can imagine this thin line extending on both directions, the same distance from the top, that tells you that most of the dogs in that group fell within that range. So what we can see here is, most or all of the dogs who are in the shelter have a much higher level of cortisol than the dogs who are sampled as pets in, 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 at their own home. Um, so there's, a, there's an initial activation, but, but is this a prolonged activation, the kind that might be detrimental? Well, here's a study where we looked at uh, uh, dogs who have been in the shelter for a number of days. And you can see the levels are very high the first three days. We have somewhat of a decline, but they're still elevated. In this 10 plus, it looks like they're back down to what would be resting levels, but we also had a number of dogs who were well beyond 10 days here. When we did a study later and we looked at dogs on just day one and day 10, the levels on day 10 were still very much elevated over dogs who were pets and sampled in their own home. And in another study, we looked at a different measure. Now this is an immune measure. And the only reason I bring it up is that the, this neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is sometimes considered a better measure of chronic stress. And, and what we found was that the, this measure actually increased rather than decreased from day one to day 10. Mm -hmm. um, other experimenters have also found this general effect for the cortisol uh, and, and their studies and, and some of ours suggest that dogs that are uh, released by their owners to shelters are particularly vulnerable for long, uh, uh, long well, or high levels of cortisol and long lasting uh, high levels. Um, and dogs that are particularly fearful are, are uh, susceptible. So what can be done about it? Well, this is where we took a, a cue from the laboratory. So there's a phenomenon referred to as social buffering. Um, and this is something that, that I've been doing for a long time. We do it now with guinea pigs. So, so this is a young guinea pig. It's, it's about weaning age. It's totally physiologically mature. And we've just taken away from the home cage. 
and we've placed it into a novel cage, an unfamiliar cage, for about an hour. Now, that isn't much of a manipulation, but for a prey species like the ancestors of domestic guinea pigs, this is you know, a, a threatening environment, a brightly lit open space they can't get away from. And you can see, excuse me, that the, the cortisol levels are, are greatly elevated here. Now, if we just place Uh-oh, something's not working. Oh, there it goes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Let me go back. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave it here. But if we put the mother in the cage, the cortisol levels go all the way back to resting levels. So I was given a talk about these uh, many years ago, and a fellow in the front row asked the question and uh, uh, raised his hand, and, and he said, would this work with dogs? And, and, and it turned out that this fellow who raised his hand was this guy here, David Tuber. And uh, David uh, uh, is, is widely recognized as, as, uh, as a result of his 1974 paper, really initiating this whole movement to use psychological principles to work with behavior in dogs. So to make a long- Dr. Hennessy, sorry to interrupt. The, um, the little thing that says next, previous, we can all see that uh, right now. How do I get, the way okay, to how do I get, close. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Is that, okay. Perfect. All right, all right. so uh, to make a long story short, uh, we did a study. And we did the study with David's own eight dogs. And we had five conditions in this study, and all dogs were tested in all conditions. So in one, they were just handled, and then they were returned. They, they lived in pairs in, 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 in a kennel together. These were litter mates, and they lived basically, they were slept in that kennel together the, their entire life. And so uh, we did this manipulation, and four hours later, we took a blood sample. Then one dog was taken to a novel cage in a different location, and the other one remained in the home cage. This was done, we waited four hours and took a blood sample for each dog. So that's the alone home and the alone novel. Then we had a situation where we put both dogs into the novel environment, and this is the dog novel. And finally, the picture I showed you before where David was in the, 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 the cage. And David sat still the entire time. He only petted the dog if the dog solicited interaction from him. And, and the results were a little bit surprising. Parts of them weren't. So, so we, here we had a low resting level. Uh, lone home, we weren't terribly surprised that, that the dog's still in the familiar home cage. It's not going to show a cortisol response. If it was in the novel cage, like other species, novelty produced a big increase in glucocorticoid levels. Uh, but the, the dog's kennel mate that had lived with you know, its entire life did not reduce those levels, but David did. So really it was the, the, the human attachment figure that was most effective in reducing these glucocorticoid levels of the dogs. So this is the finding that got me interested in working in shelters. And the first social buffering study we did in, in uh, a shelter had a very simple design. We took a blood sample, then we waited 20 minutes. And during that 20 minutes, dogs either went back to their home kennel or they were petted for 20 minutes either by a woman or by a man. We had several women and several men, equal numbers of each. And then we took a second blood sample. And what we found was actually kind of disappointing. The first blood sample produced an elevation of cortisol in the second blood sample, but the human interaction when you combine the males and the females together had no effect. But when we looked at the data more closely and we looked at the differences between the men and the women, this is what we saw. So if, if the dogs had gone back with a man, there was a, 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 an increase in cortisol uh, in the second sample as a result of the first sample. But if they were with the woman, there was no increase. If anything, there was a slight decline in cortisol levels. So this puzzled us for a while, uh, but we finally decided that probably what was going on had to do with the way that the men and the women interacted with the dogs. So the women tended to use a, a, a sort of a soft massaging technique. This was something David referred to as the soft technique, massage the neck, talk to the dogs in a high pitched soothing voice, basically baby talk. Um, and so then we, we uh, took the guys, and the guys, by the way, would you know, be sort of more upbeat, more playful. Um, and so um, uh, we took the guys, we took them to another shelter, and we had the girls teach them the pet like they did. And then when we did the study, this is what we found. So we, in the control condition where they went back to the home cage, then the um, uh, cortisol levels again inc increased. Um, if anything, the, the, the petting by a male now actually had a greater effect than petting with a female. Um, but 
really those two different those two uh, groups did not differ statistically from one another. And if you combine them and looked at the control group, uh, there was a significant reduction due to petting. So basically, um, petting worked, but that was the first lesson we learned. And that is that the type of interaction that you, you, you uh, exert with the dog in the shelter makes a difference. So a soothing interaction is important. The, the second lesson we learned has to do with where the interaction occurs. So if I look at that uh, last finding again, you know, we did present, I'm sorry, prevent an increase in cortisol uh, from the first blood sample, but we didn't reduce the levels to the shelter itself, all right? So we, we would expect that if we reduced to the shelter, we would see levels coming down to here somewhere. Um, and so what, what was going on there? Well, maybe one thing that concerned us was that the dogs were continually exposed to all the sounds of, of the other dogs. We were testing them in a room that was just off the, the, the uh, uh, housing area and uh, all the noise and the barking, you know, the relentless noise just kept on. There were all the smells and, and so forth. And, and we tried several other experiments. Finally, we were able to get a a, a little room, a part of a room in the back of the shelter that was secluded, it was quiet. And so then we did a study there, okay? And in that study, we had five treatments. We had two control conditions where the dog either had a blood sample taken and then went back to the home cage and then had a second blood sample taken 30 minutes later, or it was isolated in the secluded room for that 30 minutes, or it went in with a, with a human in, in that, uh, for that 30 minute period. And the, the human was either sitting passively, it, uh, she petted the dog or she played with the dog. So the design was a blood sample, a 30 minute treatment, and then another blood sample. And, and this is what we found here. So if you look at the control conditions with the, the open symbols, um, there was no change, no significant change in cortisol in either the home cage or if they were take, taken to the secluded room, but there were no people in the secluded room. But if somebody was in secluded room with them, whether they were playing with them, petting them, or just sitting on the stool, there was a significant reduction in cortisol levels. And I should say that uh, in later studies, we found that, uh, one later study, we found that um, this was true for strays, but the, the, we did not see a significant reduction when we looked at dogs who had been released by their owners. A little bit of reduction, but was not statistically significant. So anyhow, the, the second uh, lesson we learned was that where the interaction occurs and in a secluded room is, is really the, uh, uh, the, the best place, someplace where it's quiet and then you get the soothing interaction. Okay. Now, the, uh, 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 a little caveat here is that um, the, the effects, despite the fact early on, it looked like these effects may persist. When we return dogs to their kennel after this interaction, their levels were no longer significantly different from where they were before we ever started. So they seem to come right back up. Um, and uh, another research group, uh, Clive Wynn's research group at Arizona State has uh, looked at cortisol levels in dogs that are fostered for one night or two nights. And what they find is that throughout that period of time that they're fostered, cortisol levels are down. But as soon as they go back to the shelter, they jump back up again. So uh, I, I think it's fair to say that, that human interaction is a, is a positive welfare manipulation because it does reduce the physiological stress response, um, but it's not gonna be the answer to uh, uh, stress in a shelter overall. Okay. The next thing I wanna talk about is a manipulation that, that does have a very significant effect for at least some dogs. And that is dogs that come into a shelter typically are fearful and some dogs are, are very fearful. And this is not an uncommon reaction to see. This is fear-induced aggression or stress-induced aggression. It's, a, it's a, a known form of aggression. It's been identified in laboratory animals as well. And for dogs, you see it when they, they're threatened, they're, they're fearful and they have no means of, of escape. And the more fearful dogs are more likely to show it. This kind of behavior is not gonna get the dog adopted and it's likely to get the dog euthanized. And that's because um, many shelters use temperament tests and, and those temperament tests like the safer here focus a lot on aggression in various situations. And so if a dog is tested soon after it comes in and it's very fearful, then um, uh, the dog could be 
uh, chosen for for euthanasia. And and it, it needs to be said too that this study this test was never the safer was never meant to be used alone. It was it was always intended to be used with other sources of information. But with busy shelters and so forth, sometimes it's really the determining factor. So Regina was working in the shelter, uh, working with dogs and was working with some of these dogs. And she came to me one day and said, she thought she was reducing the aggression enough to pass the safer test. So we said, okay, well, let's do a study. So we again, took them to a secluded room, but by now we had sort of ginned up the secluded room that Regina had. And so now we had a bigger portion, we had a couch, we had a rug, we had toys, we had treats. Um, and then the dogs came in here um, we enrolled them on day one. That's the first day in the shelter. Uh, we gave them a two 15 minute sessions a day in here. We petted them if we could, or, or she did. It was a, a Regina did all of this. Uh, petted them if she could, uh, if not, do what they wanted to do. Um, and then on day six, they took the safer test. Now, it's important to point out that the, the staff that normally did the safer test did the safer test in this situation as well. And they didn't know that we were measuring safer performance. We were, we were testing these, doing some additional tests with these dogs after the safer. And so we just told the staff, we'll give them the safer and we'll, we're gonna do some testing then. And, and so they did the safer and this is what we found. Um, we found that for dogs that were fearfully aggressive and got no treatment, two thirds of them failed the safer test. Okay, only a third passed. But if they had this human interaction, then over three quarters of them passed the test. So this was a pretty striking finding for us. So we replicated it. And in the second study, we got even uh, larger results. So now 15 out of 16 that got the enrichment with, based on human interaction passed and only 12% of those who did not. For comparison, we looked at some dogs that were just, you know, dogs that came in the shelter that weren't terribly fearful. And here they almost all passed. So at least in our study, you know, the dogs that passed, that failed the safer were largely dogs who were fearfully aggressive. So it kind of summarized where we are. Cortisol, you know, increases in shelter admittance. We can, we can reduce the cortisol level. Uh, it seems to be a temporary effect. Fear aggression increases, uh, but it can be reduced. But the last thing I want to talk about is um, more of a like a cautionary note, I, I suppose. And, and this is based uh, purely on uh, uh, research findings, uh, studies with laboratory animals and, and studies with people. And this is that there's a lot of, I mean, an awful lot of, of research indicating that stress can have long-term effects that may not show up for some period of time afterwards. And I wanna give you just a few specific examples to give you a little flavor of the kind of thing I'm talking about, okay? So in one study, uh, juvenile rats uh, were exposed to social instability, which means that they had a different cage mate every day. And then when they looked at these, these animals in adulthood and they measured uh, uh, social behavior, they found a deficit in social behavior in the rats. In a second study with um, juvenile or with, with pregnant female rhesus monkeys, they received unpredictable noise um, uh, throughout portions of gestation. And uh, uh, you know it was an irritating noise that came on at, at, at uh, unpredictable times. And when they measured the uh, rhesus monkeys in um, uh, the juvenile period, they showed uh, a number of abnormal behaviors, and stu including stereotype behavior, and their play was greatly reduced. Uh, in rat pups, if you separate rat pups, these were separated for the first two weeks of life, three hours a day. When they became adults, they exhibited anxiety-like behavior and increased glucocorticoid responses to stress. And in this one, just watching other mice lose fights over a period of days increased depressive-like behavior in adult mice a, a month later. So, so the first thing I wanna point out about this is that if we look at the outcomes, you know, these are not the kind of outcomes that a shelter wants to have when their dogs get adopted sometime later. Uh, and the other thing I want to point out is that it, it's predominantly in younger animals. Now, I, I picked these, these uh, uh, examples, but if you go to the literature, at least 75%, maybe closer to 90% of the studies are ones where you're looking at young animals or fetuses, that is stressed females during pregnancy, and they're seeing their effects when uh, uh, they get older, when the, when the pups, the young, get older. And uh, it's not just ours, uh, it's not just these species, it's, it's our species as well. 
you know, in developmental psychology now, if, if not the biggest question people are looking at, one of the biggest uh, has to do with early life effects. And, and it's become so abundantly clear now that early life abuse, whether it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect from a parent who, who's a drug addict, maternal separation like happened at our southern border recently, or it's just living in poverty sometimes, that this can greatly increase chances that when these individuals are juveniles or, or adults, that they will uh, uh, develop depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, schizophrenia, a number of things. Um, and, and, and so this is, this is, um, the you know it, it to me it, it really raises the question of, of how about these dogs in, in in shelters you know and and so what's supposed to be happening here well the the it, it, there's there's a number of answers uh, uh, there's a number of mechanisms that are involved but in some way the stress response system gets enhanced okay this is sort of an example of that notion so you know if any of us are stressed in adulthood that there are odds of, of uh, you know, something serious, you know, um, like a messy divorce or something, you know, our odds of becoming depressed are going to increase, you know, rather than if we're in a low stress time. But for those who had the childhood stress, the increase is much greater. It's much more pronounced. The stress effect is amplified. So, so what is the mechanism? What is in the brain that's, that's doing this? And, and here there are uh, seemingly several things that are involved. But one primary one is cortisol. So this is a, um, a summary graph from a, a slide, uh, a review paper rather, uh, with children. And, and the point of this whole thing is, is that uh, it appears that the, well, the early life stress is related to the adult depression. It appears to be mediated primarily by cortisol. The cortisol goes up, it affects brain structure and function, which leads to the depression. There are other things that can also be involved, in, you know, including uh, uh, immune measures and so forth. And there's, there's things that can modify this effect. But cortisol, the kid's cortisol, when it's responding, is, is the primary one. But it's not even necessarily the kid's cortisol. So if the pregnant mother is exposed to stress, she releases cortisol. And we now know that more of that cortisol gets to the fetus than we thought at one time. And so that, that, that fetus is now exposed to cortisol during the, the prenatal period. And, and very recent findings that have shown that there are effects of cortisol being passed through the milk to, to the young uh, uh, when, they're, um, uh, when they're born. So, so all of this then just really raises the question for me, how much of this is happening in the shelter? You know, if, if it happens to dog, if it happens rather to rats, it happens to people, it happens to monkeys. I mean, why doesn't it happen to dogs? And, and, and if a stress that increases cortisol for a prolonged period of time seems to be something that can do this, well, then why not the, the stay in the shelter, which uh, increases cortisol for, for a period of time? Now, the studies that do this are really difficult to do. Um, to, to really nail it down clearly. And I don't have any good data on young animals. I have one piece of data from older animals that I think is relevant for it. And I'll show you for this the question, I'll show you now. This was a study we did years ago where, where um, we looked at the cortisol response of a number of dogs. Um, that is, we took a resting level without any additional stress beyond what was going on in the shelter. Then we exposed them to an even novel, more novel environment with noise and new things. And, and then we looked at how much the cortisol went up. Then we separated the dogs, randomly assigned them to two groups, and they either got human interaction five times uh, a week for eight weeks, or they got no interaction. And then we measured the cortisol response again when those dogs were uh, at the end of the eight weeks. And what we found was this. If the dogs had gotten human interaction, the, the percent increase, the amount that the cortisol increased with the stress was pretty much the same uh, at the end of eight weeks as it was before. But for those dogs who did not get the human interaction but stayed in the shelter, the cortisol response greatly uh, increased. So again, you know, we, we, we really can't um, uh, do these studies. Uh, we haven't done them yet, but I think this question is important enough that we really need to, to try to focus on this. Um, and, and, you know, I, I wonder how many of these bad outcomes that might be attributed to 
lack of socialization or to just a bad temperament might you know really be due to uh, uh, the, the time that the young spent in a, a shelter or a puppy mill or, or some such uh, 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 stressful uh, environment. Um, and, and in the meantime, I think you know it can't hurt to 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 maybe sp uh, pay special attention to puppies and maybe especially to to pregnant females uh, uh, in the shelter environment. So so that's that's pretty much where I'm what, where we are, and I'm going to leave it there and um, let uh, Regina tell you how she's kind of scaled up this whole idea of, of the the living room to uh, uh, something we never anticipated, and that she'll also uh, say something about uh, some of the. Uh, practical implications for shelters from some of this work. Um, and then a final slide, um, uh, I just wanted to list the, the, the papers that provided all the findings for the specific uh, findings that I've reported here, and then to acknowledge our funding sources for, for our studies in, the, in this group. So, so thank you. And, and I guess, Regina, I guess you go here and I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Hennessy. Really, really exciting information shared thus far. And Regina, excited to hear what you have to say next. Thank you, Sheila. Um, very happy to be here. Um, this is very exciting. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. And uh, while I worked in the shelter providing assistance for fearful dogs and those dogs in our study, I noticed a group of dogs that did not accept any human act interaction um, from us, and they were actually declining in the shelter um, each day that they were housed. Uh, we discovered that this group of dogs uh, were those dogs that were surrendered to the shelter by their owners. Um, although the strays, and strays are those dogs that are found um, by animal control running the streets, they accepted human interaction from us um, wonderfully. Um, and they actually improved in the shelter, uh, but those owner surrenders did not. Um, further, after speaking to those owners and to the staff, um, we found that a large group of those dogs were surrendered due to the behavior issues. Um, this got me thinking about the things that we could do to assist those owners who were struggling with those dogs, um, you know, with their behavior issues and how I could possibly help them um, keep them out of the shelter. And this is where my vision began. Um, I had a long talk with my husband and we decided to move to the country and we bought a farm. So the farm is situated on five acres. Um, we actually live on property. Uh, we created Halo from the outbuildings that are there. Um, we fenced in the property completely and we officially opened in 2016. So currently we have enough space to house about 12 dogs. Um, each room is um, the size, it's about a 10 by 10 size. It contains, um, each room contains um, a twin bed, uh, soft bedding, toys and chewies, um, a TV plays classical music or um, a favorite movie. Um, we have lavender diffusers. We have cameras to watch them during their um, activity. I, I watch them at night a lot to make sure they're sleeping and they're resting. Um, each room has a window, um, a French door looking out into the living room. And obviously the living room is their favorite place to be. So these are the, um, the couches the dogs, you know, just jump up and uh, lay on. They specifically like to um, cuddle with the volunteers when they come to visit. But um, we do continue to serve the clients that are considering um, surrendering the dogs. And then we also um, work with many dogs that um, we take from the shelter. Now, our mission remains the same today as it did when we opened the doors. We focus on those dogs that their owners just cannot handle due to behavior problems. Um, and we really, really work to um, keep them out of the shelter. And we do this by offering different services to assist them, um, such as their behavior modification um, programs, training programs, daycares, grooming, and boarding. Um, and we do this because we know that owners need a support system. Um, and it's very important um, to me that um, you know, the support system is needed to keep these dogs out of the shelter. Um, many people who surrender their pets say that they would have kept them if they had resources um, such as low cost training, behavior modification, 
Um, with the help of many shelters in my region, we are able to reduce these numbers of the animals entering um, the shelter and we are um, increasing the number of animals leaving the shelter. Uh, many shelters call this program intake diversion and they've gone to many steps to create a, a very successful program such as hiring staff They've gone to many steps to create a, a uh, program such as hiring staff to answer the calls about surrendering their pets. Um, these trainers talk to, uh, you know, these individuals about training tools, behavior modification, and they do uh, keep in close contact with their owners. Um, they also work to help these, uh, the dogs that are adopted, some of the uh, hard to place dogs um, they help them by um, just assisting with their, their training um, post-adoption. Um, because the uh, behavior modification is limited while the dog um, is in the shelter, they also reach out to uh, training facilities such as HALO. And um, we've created a, a uh, good partnership. Um, this past year, HALO has partnered with a nonprofit organization called Private School Pups, and they're in Columbus, Ohio. Um, we currently uh, are working with our shelter in Columbus um, with hopes of expanding uh, uh, our program. But what, um, what we do is Private School Pups offers coupons for training, uh, boarding, et cetera, anything that that dog needs to adopters who have adopted a hard to place dog um, and HALO is providing the training. We um, are very successful. We've been very successful with this program and we hope to continue, um, but we rely heavily on grants. So depending on the grant, um, the funding, um, we will be able to continue this. Now this is um, Flower and this is Flower's mom. Flower was adopted from Franklin County. Um, she's um, dog reactive but we've been working with her for about a year and um, she can now walk beside a dog. Um, she's actually played with the dog at Halo and they are sitting in a small cottage um, called Flowers House. Um, and this cottage really, um, it's, it's um, positioned away from the uh, building that we house the dogs in. Um, and what this provides is a um, quiet place where she doesn't have to hear the dogs barking and she doesn't become aroused. And um, this helps us really work with her and she is not as stressed as what she would be, um, you know, in, the, in that environment. Um, now, shelters have begun to do similar things with their extra rooms in their house, in their shelter, I'm sorry. They have created uh, real life rooms, and um, this is to make, make things more comfortable for the dogs, um, keeping them away from that loud kennel area. Um, and these are specifically designed for dogs that do not do well in the loud kennel area. Um, and we feel like it's extremely important for um, pregnant moms and um, puppies to go into those rooms. Um, now, our partner shelter in Columbus is um, really advanced because they have about 20 of these rooms. Um, obviously, they're not as um, fancy as this picture, but um, they do provide cots and toys and things like that. Um, but in my, my professional opinion, I feel like the most successful program for a shelter is a foster-based program. Now, foster homes are essentially um, essential for shelters um, for those dogs that do not do well in the shelter. Sometimes foster programs are difficult to continue um, because uh, many of these dogs cannot be safely placed in, in a home. So some dogs display aggression, um, fear aggression um, to people. They also display some severe dog-to-dog uh, -dog reactivity or aggression. Um, and they do have the potential to harm the foster parent um, and those in the community. So that's where HALO comes in. Now, we, um, we provide, uh, most of our shelters here locally will not allow a um, dog with a behavior problem to leave that shelter um, unless they have a facility like HALO um, as a partner. Um, 
these behavior dogs are dogs that, again, are displaying severe dog aggression, um, aggression towards people, um, and they have the potential to bite. Um, unfortunately, those dogs remain in the shelter unless they go to a facility uh, like Halo, um, but they become worse um, and most of them are euthanized. Now, HALO opened with the original mission of just becoming a tra transitional shelter so that we thought, you know, that would be a place for a dog to stay, um, get behavior modification, be, be ready to go into a foster home or a forever home. Now, we have slowly transitioned into what I believe a, la a large foster home. Um, our facility is housed with dogs that have these behavior issues, but they're, um, you know, they're, they're definitely controlled. The environment is controlled, um, they, but they're living their best life. You know, they receive training um, in addition, like I said, to be in a, in a controlled environment, um, but they have everything they need. They have everything that a foster home would provide. Um, but these dogs stay quite a while, so they could stay an average of six months um, until they typically our dogs will transition right over into a foster to adopt program or a forever home. They're, they're just adopted. Um, our dogs are spoiled rotten, which they should be. Um, our dogs are taken off site for walks on, on a bike path that we have close. Um, we go um, to store visits, we go to Lowe's, Home Depot, those types of places. Um, they're cuddled, um, cared for, um, just like they were our own. We love them just the same. One thing that we do provide is, um, you know, obviously you see the other pictures, but uh, we provide um, human interaction. We feel like the shelter dogs cannot get that. That's no fault of the shelter um, in itself. Um, the shelter workers do not have time to go in every room and cuddle the dogs. Um, but we feel like this is the most valuable tool that we have. Uh, we've shown this um, in the shelters uh, with our studies. And um, what this does is we slowly earn the dog's trust. And when we earn their trust, we can do anything. The training just, just falls uh, right into place. So in addition to our behavior modification and training, we also provide the daycare, the grooming and the boarding to our clients. Uh, we believe that our clients should be supported uh, because if they don't have the support, they're most likely um, going to surrender that dog to the shelter. Um, we feel like that is the most important um, service that we can offer um, in our community. So our behavior daycare allows the dogs to socialize with many dogs. So many of these dogs you see in the picture could not play with another dog. Um, they're monitored closely. We're, you know, we're worked, we work with them. Um, we, we teach them how to socialize and uh, many issues can be corrected by socialization. Our boarding dogs are behavior clients. So they stay at the same facility as the halo dogs and they see, they receive the same enrichment, the human interaction and human interaction and the training. Um, because we are a nonprofit, what happens is all of the money that is paid for um, the boarding and the, the grooming and the daycare gets funneled right back into the care of the Halo dogs. Um, obviously, um, as a nonprofit, we do rely on um, donations and grants to help with the care. So in conclusion, I'd like to just reiterate what Dr. Hennessy spoke about earlier. Um, it's extremely important to get these dogs that are suffering with stress and anxiety out of the shelter. Um, those pregnant females, um, pregnant moms especially should have direct foster placement. Um, but in addition, let's think outside the box a little bit with facilities such as Halo for those behavior dogs um, that cannot leave the shelter. Um, it's very, very important. Um, we have seen here at Halo, we've seen the results of dogs staying long-term in shelters and those dogs being housed as young pups. 
Um, although the research is needed, more research is needed, but we believe that moving away from the traditional shelter and more towards foster homes and foster home type organizations like HALO um, should be made a priority in the future. And I would like to thank you. Um, this is Bo. He's adoptable and he thanks you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hennessy and Regina. It has been absolutely wonderful to have you both here today. Next month, we're going to be talking with Dr. Frank McMillan, who's going to talk to us about the concept of social pain as compared to physical pain in animals. And we welcome and invite everybody to continue the discussion on this very exciting topic on Maddie's Pet Forum. Thank you all for joining us so much today.